Well, I hope everyone had a great Christmas, able to celebrate with family, and you didn't eat too much, and you didn't eat all the sweets that are laying around like I have, all that kind of fun stuff, just in time for New Year's, right? So anyway, glad you're with us this morning, church. Good to see you. And uh, we're going to take a minute before we get there. But if you want to turn in your Bibles or in one of the pew Bibles in front, we will be in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 in a little bit. But I just want to walk us a little bit. And Christmas just ended. I mean, we, you know, it's been just a few days. And we just had Christmas. And we turned the calendar to a whole new year in just a couple of more days. In fact, it's a whole new decade, which is kind of a crazy thing to think about, that uh, we're starting that. And in case you haven't done the math, the year 2000 was now 20 years ago, which seems ridiculous when you consider that all that's happened in the last 20 years and all that we thought was going to happen at the year, 20, or year 2000 and none of that came about and all of the craziness. But as, a new, as the start of a new year happens, if you're like anything like most people, there begins the whole introspection and you start to look at the resolutions that you won't keep I mean that you'll try and keep and uh, you know all of those different things but uh, this month we're gonna go a little bit different direction and so this series uh, this this morning we're just kind of doing a one-off message that will kick into a series next week that we're gonna start for the month of January called chasing carrots and really, it's the whole idea of if you've ever seen the cartoon or in the comedies where they're holding the stick and there's the carrot in front of the horse, it's to get the horse to move or the animal to move. It's that idea. What are those things that we are chasing that really are unattainable, that we quite never quite reach? We're going to talk about that the whole month of January. But today, I wanted to set that up with helping us kind of recalibrate a little bit. And I want us to think a little bit differently. And we know about Christmas. We understand what Christmas meant and the initiation of God's plan as far as the redemption of mankind that happened at the birth of Jesus. We understand that God's life, that the life of Jesus was actually not just a life that we get to read about, but it's actually the story of a life that can be lived, committed to Christ, and are committed to God and, and surrendered to his will. I don't know if you realize that, but when you read the accounts of Jesus' life, while he was perfect because he was God, and we're not perfect, the life of Jesus is there not so, so for the lessons that he teaches us and, and the words that we have written, but it's the example of a, what a life that is surrendered to God can do. And we don't have to fight through the perfection, and we'll get to that in a moment, but it's his life. So his, his birth initiates God's plan. His life is the example of God's plan. But then we know that it, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Jesus was the culmination of his plan. That it was through his death and his burial that we actually no longer have to fear death. That through his sacrifice on the cross, there is salvation. And we know about all of this, and we understand all of those markers, and we understand all those realities, but what I think either we don't understand or we forget is what does it mean for us today? And what does it mean for uh, those of us who have stepped into faith and acknowledged our need of a Savior, and we've acknowledged the work of Jesus, what does it actually mean for us because if we just leave it at the things that we described, it's this far off reality, so to speak. It's these things that happened thousands of years ago that we read in a book occasionally and that some guy talks about on a Sunday if we make it and all of this different stuff. But if we don't really understand what it all means for us individually, we don't really know what it's supposed to look like and what's supposed to happen in our lives. And so we get to a, por a portion of scripture that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. In fact, it's actually his second letter to the same church that we're given. There may have been more, scholars believe, but this is a church in the city of Corinth. And what we are going to see is there are truths from the work of Jesus that when we surrender our lives to him, things happen. Or better said, is there are things that did happen, but maybe we have forgotten or we have really never known the implications of what our life would be. And so we're going to look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're going to pick it up in, chapter, in verse 14. But what we're picking up is this reminder to the church. Now again, these are written to people who believe in Jesus. So we are, we are stepping into a letter to a conversation between one of the church leaders and the people that are part of the church. And he's reminding them 
of a few things that are real about God. Now, Jesus, for many of these people, they didn't see Jesus on earth. It was later than that. So they wouldn't have seen Jesus, but they would have heard from the firsthand accounts that we're given. And they would have heard about other witnesses who had lived there or they had grandparents that lived or whatever the case may be. And I apologize if that's hard to read. I'd encourage you to look in your scriptures. But 2 Corinthians 5, starting in verse 14, says this. It says, For the love of Christ controls us, because we have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live, who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. Verse 16, but from, from now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 19, that is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the measure of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on the behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Would you pray with me again this morning? Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the work that Paul reminds us of in 2 Corinthians. And Lord, we pray this morning that you would allow our hearts and our ears to hear from your word this morning. Lord, that it would be afresh and anew to us, that we would be rekindled by your truth this morning. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to walk through this text, most of it, not all of it, but we're going to walk through this text and I want us to see the implications that Paul is putting on those of us who are believers. And the first one we come to is in verse 11 and it's about five words in and it says we are, the, for the love of Christ controls us. So there is this idea of control. And Paul feels pressure. What we have to understand is as we're looking at Paul's writings, we have to understand Paul a little bit. As you read Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament, if you read Paul, a lot of the same themes are in his writings. In fact, elsewhere in one of his writings, he talks about being pressed but not crushed. And all of these different adjectives that he gives us, and he's actually using the same word controlled here, that he used for the idea of pressed in that scripture. But Paul's pressure here is on both sides. He's feeling the pressure of being with Christ, of his longing, of his spiritual desire to be in eternity with Christ. And he's also feeling the pressure of staying here on earth and living longer because Christ still has something for him to do. See, Paul understood that there is eventually, in the, in the life of a believer, there is eventually a longing that happens to go and to be with our, with our Savior in eternity. But though, there's also the reality for those of us who are still living and breathing that there is a life to be lived and there is still purpose to be had. The word for control is, this, is in the original word is syneko. And here's what it means. It means pressure applied. It's really what the word control there means. But not so much as in control, as in you're moving somebody, but more like pressed into action. The best picture that came to mind as I was studying for this this week is if you've ever squeezed anything and it went forward. It's that idea. Toothpaste, if you roll at the bottom, which doesn't matter, by the way. But if you start at the bottom, it's the idea of being pressed to where it moves, where it goes out, where there is a motion, there's action that takes place. So when Paul says to us that he, we are, the, for the love of Christ controls us, what he is saying is that for the love of Christ propels us is a good way of also saying it. That it's Christ's love that propels and moves us forward. In fact, it's a present tense word. It's a continuous pressure. And the source is the love of God. Notice the statement there, for the love of Christ controls us. So the source of this propelling is not from any desire to uh, 
attain anything. It's not any desire to earn anything. It is simply the propelling, the movement, the force, the pressure of the love of God that compels us or controls us to move and to be active and to be a part of something. Matt Chandler, a pastor in Texas, put it this way. He said, you cannot do life for Jesus if you don't do life with Jesus. It's impossible to do life for Jesus if you don't do life with Jesus. Spending time with him, getting to know him, understanding his purpose, understanding his heart, understanding his love. In fact, if you continue in verse 14, he makes this statement, Paul does, it says, we've concluded this, that Jesus died for all. Now, I'm going to nerd out for a second because it's important. Most of us don't understand the original language, nor do we have access in our everyday, unless you have a library or software or something like that, that tells you the, every, the original word here. But the original word that is used in this statement that Jesus died for us. So in the statement, we have concluded this, that one has died for all. The word there is actually the word, it's, it's the early word is hyper, and it actually means for all. Now that's important because there is another word that is used elsewhere in scripture. It's actually the preface that we would use, anti, A-N-T-I. But it actually implies instead of. So the word that Paul is using here to imply what Jesus did for us is that he died and we don't have to. Rather, he died instead of, but there's still a cost coming for us. It's a big deal because if we understand that Jesus' sacrifice eliminated all responsibility as far as paying the price of our sins from us, then we can begin to be compelled by this love that he's talking about. This is the substitutionary meaning of the death of Jesus. Verse 15, we see the phrase, one died for all. So for the one to die for all, that one has to be uniquely significant. It can't just be a normal person. It can't just be a normal thing. It has to be, he would have had to have been uniquely significant. And we're, you're saying to me, yes, I understand this. But I think we sometimes mentally understand these things, but we don't allow them to get into our hearts and dictate how we live. Because there's a difference between knowing something and being propelled by something. The commentator Paul Barnett put it this way. He said, the love of Christ keeps Paul from living for himself and instead causes him to pour out his life for others. For Paul, egocentricity has given way to Christocentricity. So here's what this commentator is saying. He's saying that the love of God, the love of Christ, the work of Christ has replaced in his life the me-centered reality that we all strive and like to live in and is, is fall our default setting. And it has been replaced by the Christ-centered reality that everything is anchored and purposed in him. And see, it matters as we train the clock, as we turn, turn the calendar to a new year, it matters because if we don't realize some realities about Jesus, we will just continue to do the same things we've always done, hoping to get a different result. Which, by the way, that's called insanity. Like, that's actually the definition of insanity. Is trying to do the same thing over and over again and hoping for a different result. So what we have to be able to look at is, what is it that Christ, that God has done for us? What is it that maybe I don't quite understand about God that would help me approach my life for Christ differently? And I believe it's some of what an understanding that he died for all of us. Here's, here's a couple other scriptures that emphasize this. Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews in chapter 2, verse 9 says this. He says, but we see him who for a little while was made lower than the angels namely Jesus, crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so by that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. You see, if we begin to understand this one died for all reality, it automatically begins to help us to see things differently. And we'll get there. I'm getting ahead of myself. <clears throat> 
1 John 2, 2 says that he is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the world. Which leads us to verse 16. And look at verse 16 with us. It says, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. So the implication in that sentence that Paul is saying that through the work of Christ and the realization of Christ in our lives, what happens out of that is our entire perspective changes. Our entire point of view, our entire way of looking at everything should change. The scriptures declare that God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. They are higher than ours. So it is automatic that the perspective of an earthly person and the perspective of God are going to be different. But when we come into relationship with Christ and we are no longer ours, but we allow the scriptures to renew our mind and we allow the scriptures to fill our heart, what we begin to do is we begin to see things differently. And I love what Paul tells us here. We no longer see people and we know we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ. Here's the beauty of this statement. This statement right here eliminates the statement that we will sometimes hear from well-intending people, and I th in fact, I've probably even said it myself, my God would never do that. Here's the problem. Our God usually isn't the same God that's in the Bible. Our God is usually a God we can control, we can understand, we could manipulate to make him do the things that we think he should do so that we get the results we want to get. I can't repeat that, so if, you got, if you're taking notes, you missed it. Bottom line is, our ways and God's ways aren't the same. So here's what this means. When we come to Scripture and we read a difficult portion of Scripture, because my friends, I promise you, if you read very far, you will get to one. And our first thought is, that can't be how God acts. We have to allow the Holy Spirit to work in our hearts and say, Holy Spirit, don't allow my perspective to take place. What is your perspective? Because here's what we know about God. He is just, and He is right, and it will all work out the way it's supposed to at the end. And we joke about this, and I've joked about it before, that when we get to heaven, I'm going to ask God all of these questions. I have them, but I'm pretty sure they won't matter when we get there. They just won't. For one of two reasons. Either A, we're standing before God, or B, which Scripture says, in a twinkling of an eye, we will be changed. We'll have the understanding we need, which is actually what I think will happen. We will suddenly be able to see the things that, we, that Paul is declaring over us that we should be striving to do is to look through his perspective. So here's how this plays out. We don't get it. I don't fully understand it. I'm not sure why the world looks one way, but the scripture says it's supposed to look a different way. Well, I've got to trust this because this is the truth of God and this is just somebody else's truth. I don't get this, but I trust God. And I think that's okay. The other thing it does is it helps us see, the other thing it should do is it helps us see people differently. I, I have friends in ministry and, and we all say different things, but there are, if we're not careful, the world of Christendom can be boiled down to two things. Us versus them. The saved versus the unsaved. Those who know Christ versus those who don't. Which all are, the us versus them is not appropriate, but they're all appropriate delineations. Those are, those are real categories that we could put people in. But I have a friend who actually, he calls, and I like how he use, does it, he, he calls one, he calls the believers saved, and non-believers or those who don't know Jesus yet, he calls them pre-saved. It'll click eventually. Meaning that he doesn't see them as not as God's impossibility. He sees them as God's possibility and it's up to us to share his love with them. Which I'll get to in a moment. So our whole outlook changes and things lose their importance of what becomes important to us is one day standing before God. We, we measure God in human point of view. Here's... Here's how you know if it's human criteria. It probably is a wrong conclusion. 
If you look about God and you're thinking about what God would, would do or how God would behave or how we can enable that, and we think it's going to be different or our criteria measure it up and it's different than what he is saying or what we see represented here, then that's usually a view of human criteria, not a view of God's criteria. Verse 17 declares a newness of life in Christ. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The tension of participating in the newness of Christ while living as part of the old. Do you ever feel that? This tension that you know as a follower of Christ, as a believer in Christ, as somebody who wants to live their life according to the truths of Christ, that you have this tension that Paul described that the things I want to do, I don't do, and the things I don't want to do are the things that I do. Because it's this tension of living no longer the same in the same old thing. What Scripture declares is we are in the world but not of it. It is that constant tension of walking in the darkness and the depravity and the brokenness that is humanity while understanding we have been restored and redeemed and recaptured. See, what, what I, the reason I entitled this, this sermon Restored is because I love the idea, not the work, be clear, but I love the idea of a restoration. Because it's this old, broken down thing that, that nobody sees any, any possibility in, nobody sees anything of value in, but then all of a sudden you do some work, you do some effort, you put some money into it, you put some sweat into it, and all of a sudden it has value. Well, that's really where we are, if we're honest. That our lives prior to Christ, if on, on the look at them, had no value. Our look, the, the look of our lives, if, if we could look at our hearts, not just the external, not just what we put out there for people to see, but if we could understand what was going on, it was the broken down, the disheveled, the boarded up, the, the, the spray painted on, the, the whole thing you think of when you think of a major restoration project. And over time, God is putting the sweat and literally the blood and his grace and pouring those things into it. And over time, it's the masterpiece that he had designed, not the one that we had designed. So it's the newness of life. But Paul in Romans says another, says it a different way. And I want us to look, Romans 8, and we're going to read 18 through 25. He says, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us I don't have time, but I'm going to say it anyway. This one sentence right here is something that you can hang your proverbial hat on. That the sufferings, the challenges, the difficulties, the, 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 the weight of this world, the stresses of this world, the, all of those things, while in the moment are big, and I understand that, and while in the moment are impactful, I understand that, they are small and infinitesimal when you consider the glory yet to be revealed. And so as we learn to live in the newness of Christ, we learn to see those things through a biblical perspective that Christ has already handled them because of his work on the cross, death, burial, and resurrection. So we go on, 19. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoptions as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. It's an amazing declaration. That all of creation, ourselves included, we long for the day that we will read, our hope will be validated. But we place our hope in Christ not because of what we've seen, but because of who he is and what he's done. And we are able to hold on to those things. Verse 18 is huge. All this is from God, 
who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Here's the big picture of what Paul is saying in this verse. That all the obstacles of being made right to God, being reconciled to God, have been removed by Christ. And see, I know for some of us, if we, before we knew Christ, or maybe today we're even wrestling, I'm not sure I know Christ, wherever we were or are in our journey, at some point we had the thought, there is no way that God can love me the way that I am. And then we start to list the ways that we are. Okay. This verse tells us that through Christ, those obstacles have been removed. But let me, let me back it up a little bit more. Scripture declares that you and I are fearfully and wonderfully made. He tells Jeremiah that before he was born, he, while he was yet in his mother's womb, he knew him. So if God knew us then, if God knew us then and he has fearfully and wonderfully made each and every one of us and given us ultimately the label of image bearer and the responsibility of reflecting his image to people, don't you think he already knows the list of reasons why it should be impossible for him to redeem us? And yet, he did it anyway. Like, I know we're in Iowa, but that should excite us. Okay. But here's the, here's the phrase that this is talking about. God has removed the obstacles. He has reconciled us already. He performs it. It is not on our part. And then he gives us, so he reconciles us. He removes all obstacles for us, but then he also removes the obstacles for other people. That we are then given the ministry of reconciliation to declare the truth to other people. In fact, that's what verse 19 is talking about. That is in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. So if God didn't count our trespasses against us, when we surrendered our lives to him, he doesn't hold them against anyone else and we are, we are given the message of the good news of God. And then verse 21 makes this statement. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So what happens or what should happen when we enter into a relationship with God is we no longer see ourselves as the list of obstacles to his reconciliation but that we begin to see ourselves through the eyes of Christ in his reconciled, reconciled state, surrounded in his glory. And to me, this is important to us because as we do this, what we begin to notice is that our lives begin to be anchored in a different anchoring point that everything else begins to take different priorities, that everything else begins to take different importance. And it's not that the things of life that we have to engage in to be a part of the world or to make a living or to be sustainable in life are bad. As I've said a hundred times, they are bad when they become the replacement for God in our lives. And so the encouragement as we chase carrots going in the next few weeks and as we look at ourselves as these restored beings the the encouragement that i want to have for us this morning is to realize who it is that has redeemed us and the work that he has done no longer places the responsibility on us the responsibility that is now placed on us is obedience but it's because the love of christ compels us controls us And so the question this morning, as we consider the new year coming up, the question I would have for us this morning is what is compelling us? What is it that is controlling us or compelling us or pushing us forward? 
And, and I wouldn't dare ask you to answer that right now because right now it would be the church answer. But to sit down and to really evaluate and to think about it and to navigate through what is it that causes us to do the things that we do? And what is it that's at the center of that, really? Because what I think might happen is as we realize that maybe there's areas in our life that Christ isn't preeminent or center or first and foremost, hopefully as we reread maybe this week some of what Paul's saying here, is like verse 16, we once regarded, we, we regard now no one according to the flesh, even though once we, we regarded Christ according to the flesh. That hopefully our perspective gets to change. And that's my prayer as we head into 2020 for, a church, for us as a church and for us as individuals is that our perspective would change and that we would actually understand what God has in store for us. And that we would begin to look the way that we'll look at our lives and look the way that we can and say, where are the priorities? Where are the things that we really need to keep doing? And where are the things that God is pushing us forward to do? And then we would step in obedience to do those things. And friends, it's not going to be easy because the more you try and align yourself with Christ, the more the enemy is going to try and disalign you. The more you try and be obedient to what God has called you to be, the more excuses the enemy is going to try and come up with. I saw a quote, I forget who said it on social media this week, and it was simply put this way, is that the enemy, Satan, knows your name, but he doesn't call you by name, he calls us by our mistakes. Have you ever noticed that? That when we start hearing the negative talk, it's never personal. It's just what we've done. It's the mistakes that get listed off and rattled off. But yet when we allow the Holy Spirit to speak to us through God's word or in times of prayer, if I'm really paying attention, I can tell the difference because it's personal. There's a, there's a relationship on this side of it. There's a, there's a personal depth to what God is trying to say to us. So this week, over the next few days, as we change the calendar over, I would, I would encourage us to think of this as what is, it, what is God's perspective for my life for 2020? Would you pray with me? Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for, again, your scriptures and the instruction that Paul gave us. But Lord, we pray this week that you would help us to understand your perspective. That you would help us to understand that your work on the cross and the life that you have blessed us with and the grace that you have poured out and that is available to all of us ultimately changes everything. And I pray that you would allow us, that you would enable us to allow you to change us. Lord, that, that we would draw a line in the sand, if you will, that this year is going to be different because we are leaning in on you. We are striving to live according to your perspective and purpose. And if you're, not, if you're here this morning and you would say, I'm not sure I have a relationship with Christ, I want to encourage you that this morning that all of the things that we talked about are available to you. The, the last few verses were no longer holding our trespasses against us is the grace that is available to you this morning. And it's simply this, it's simply admitting to yourself and admitting to God that you have tried to be Lord of your life. You have tried to run things and admitting that it hasn't gone the way you needed and asking God to come and control and be Lord of your life, to rule in your life, and to use the word of Paul's to control, to propel us. And that if you believe in your heart that Jesus died on the cross and was raised again, that you can be saved, made right, put reconciled with him. And if you confess with your mouth, so right where you're at, you can literally just confess to God that you need him. Lord, go with us this week. Help us to 
have your ears and your eyes to see the things that we need to see and hear the things that we need to hear. We give you praise. We give you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.